I was getting close to 100 episodes of the podcast. A lot of times people ask me, well, you've had all these different people on. What have you learned? Well, maybe I could write a book. What are some of the common characteristics that these entrepreneurs share? All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Boom, the Business Owners Ownership Mindset podcast. We're here with Francisco Gonzalez, good friend of mine. We actually met at this place. Uh, what's the name of the place again? This is the Smoke Inn in Pompano Beach, Florida. The Smoke Inn in Pompano Beach, Florida. It's an awesome spot where you can smoke cigars. Francisco has a deep passion for cigars, and he also has a passion for entrepreneurship. Wrote this really cool book, The American Dream is a Terrible Thing to Waste. Now, uh, Francisco, can you tell me a bit about what got you into your passion for both cigars and entrepreneurship? Yeah, well, you know, I have found over the years that, first of all, I just love cigars because they force you to do exactly what we're doing right now. Sit down, put your phones away. I know we got phones recording us, <laughs> yeah. but uh, and actually have conversations with people. And, and, you know, especially nowadays in a world that is very fast paced, very fast moving, we're always looking at our screens, whether it's our computer screen, our TV screen, our phone screen. Um, and a lot of times we have our head down and, uh, you know, things like that. So this is good because uh, we could actually sit here, talk to each other. A cigar, depending on the size of the cigar, at least 45 minutes, maybe two hours, uh, forces you to have a conversation over that time. And I have also met so many people in cigar lounges, like randomly, whether they be here in Florida or in Guatemala or in many different places around the world. And you just meet some of the most interesting people. Because I actually think cigar lounges are full of interesting people, too. Right, yeah. Uh, including, by the way, a lot of business owners. Mm. A lot of people who are, are doing very well in business or even just entrepreneurial in nature. They also, I don't know, for whatever reason, I seem to find a lot of entrepreneurs in cigar lounges. That's pretty cool. Yeah. And, and so you just met randomly with them uh, while you were there? Uh, so many places. By the way, I mean... I, I, as you know, I, I lived in Guatemala for about a year, right? And that was when I was launching my my venture, Fearless Journeys. But I was teaching at a, a free market university called Francisco Medellin University, and I, I could meet plenty of people through the university. It's it's a really well connected place. But I also just like to go out on my own sometimes and into the city. You know, you go to a restaurant, you're going to probably sit at a table and eat by yourself if you go by yourself. In a cigar lounge, to be honest with you, I found the Caranto Club Cigar Lounge in Guatemala City. First time I went there, there was nobody there except me and the bartender. But for two hours, I was talking to him. And then he was like, hey, you know what? You should come back because based on all the stuff you do, you're going to meet some interesting people here. And I nice. thought, is this just a ploy to get me back here? But uh, actually, he was right. <laughs> it is amazing the domino effect that that cigar lounge had in my life and the, the type of people, uh, the particular people I met and also the amount of those people I was then able to introduce people to when they came on my Fearless Journey trip. They didn't necessarily have to go to the uh, cigar lounge with me. Right. Because one of them was, one of the people I met there was a, a restaurant owner. Um, and I went to his, and so we actually start most of our Fearless Journeys group trips in Guatemala City at his restaurant. He's one of the top chefs in, in Guatemala, a young Guatemalan chef. And then while I was there by myself hanging out at his restaurant, which turns into sort of a little bar at, in the evening, I started meeting people there, and then I would go to their places of business. And then, I, anyway, it's just amazing the domino effect that going to one cigar lounge might have on your life. Love it, love it. And so Fearless Journeys, you, you just mentioned this. Uh, can you tell us a bit more about what exactly Fearless Journeys is? Yeah, so Fearless Journeys is a community where I really try to connect people with innovators across the world. Now, I've had my podcast called Agents of Innovation, for almost nine years now. And I was doing that long before I started Fearless Journeys. But I was working for different organizations at the time where I would come across a lot of different business owners. And I would, maybe they were donors or people I wanted to be donors to the, to the organizations I was working for. Or maybe they were just people I met at conferences and events and throughout the course of my experiences. And I would come away from a lot of those conversations thinking, wow, I wish more people could learn about that person's story. And one day I was listening or I was, yeah, listening to a podcast when I had that thought go through my head. And as I was, I said, oh, maybe I could start a podcast where I could actually introduce people to these great, innovative people I was fortunate enough to meet. Um, advance about six or seven years, and then COVID happens, right? And now I'm sitting there with a little time on my hands. I wasn't traveling, because none of us were traveling. Um, I wasn't having meetings in person. Everything was 
We were home all the time for a couple of months. It was a mess. Even yeah. here in the free state of Florida. <laughs> and that actually gave me the idea to think about what else could I be doing with all these things I do on the side, like my podcast, my travels, my writings, all these things. Could I put something together like a company or some kind of offering that I could expand on what I'm trying to do here? Because I, at that point, I had about 70 episodes. And I started thinking, wouldn't it be cool if some of these other innovators could get to know each other? Right. And wouldn't it be cool if people that were listening could be participants? Um, and so what I want to do is turn listeners from the podcast into participants into the Fearless Journeys community. So instead of simply listening to a podcast, which is great, it's great education. You should continue listening to podcasts. That's why I continue having my right. podcast. But if you can connect with those people, because a network is, you know, I really want to help people build a world-class network. And people start seeing me and saying, oh, you know this person, you know so many different people, so many walks of life. Well, what I want to do is now turn my network over to you. So I do that through, um, we have live online sessions, which we were doing monthly. And in 2024, I have now increased it to weekly. Uh, because we have so we have more than 50 featured innovators in the Fearless Journeys community, so I and thought we could do this every every week. Are those sessions the ones where you talk about books as well, like the book club? So in addition to the sessions, because those sessions could be like, uh, you know, a, a session from a from a guy named Akash Patel, which I'm right. going to be doing tonight oh, as, awesome. as we speak. All right. And so Akash is he's like the man you need to know if you're ever in the Tampa Bay area. He has a basically a, a PR firm in Tampa, and he introduces you to that, but. He has a real, um, you know, his, one of his great strengths is his ability to network effectively. We learned that on the podcast, and tonight on the session, uh, you can learn directly from him on some of the tips, just the small things he does every day, not just to network, but to follow up, follow through, all these sorts of things. It's crucial. I'm, I'm going to be listening. Okay. I, wa I want to learn a lot about that. Yeah. yeah. So we, we do that um, where people get, get a chance to be part of those sessions. And then uh, also I do uh, a book club. So every two months we pick a new book to read over those course of two months. I send out weekly emails, whether people are reading or not, they're getting summaries of, what, uh, of what's part of those books. And oh, then at so the end of the... So, so you can even join the book club without actually reading, just like you can go with a summary? Yeah, you, yeah, so for some reason, I know a lot of people are busy. Some people keep up with the books more than others. Or right. maybe this book, you didn't keep up with the next book you do right. in terms of reading. So I think people should read the books. But, I mean, even the discussion is, is quite productive. Yeah, uh, so if you yeah. at least could get a five-minute summary every week mm -hmm. in your inbox, you could go, okay, here's the main takeaways that this author is trying to convey. Maybe you go a little deeper then and go back and read the book. But even if you don't, I want to give people the takeaways from the books. And then at the end of the two months, um, sometimes we have the author on. Like, I've been fortunate in the last three or four books, we've actually gotten the author of the book on the session. So you come on the live session and actually get to talk about the book with the guy that wrote it. Or That's pretty cool. That wrote it. That's awesome. And in addition, uh, sometimes when we don't have the author, we just take another featured innovator that maybe is a fan of the book. Right. And then they get to lead the discussion on it as well. Uh, and then the most fun part, maybe of Fearless Journeys, is the group trips we have. So you go come down to Argentina, you get to have dinner with Lucho. I right? love steak. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He will introduce you to the best steak in Argentina. And, uh, and, and a lot of other fun things. But that's what we do when we go to different places. And you we, went polo. Uh, uh, what, uh, you, you did polo. You did uh, tango. What, what, what other stuff did you do while you were in, in Argentina? Yeah, uh, we, we, so we all got a polo lesson. We got yeah. to watch professional polo players while we ate an asado barbecue lunch. Uh, we learned, by the way, the lessons from professionals, people who used to play professionally. And uh, I know, I know uh, my buddy Alexander, he came out fascinated. He was like, oh, man. I'm in trouble because this is an expensive sport and I want to keep playing. <laughs> Alexander was actually really, really good. I mean, for being on the horse for, you know, the first time. Um, and so, yeah, we do. We went to an amazing tango show on this next trip. We're not only just doing a tango show, we're going to have a, a, a tango dancing learning experience as well. Optional. I know not everybody wants to do it, but... Uh, Who but, wouldn't want to learn tango? Yeah. <laughs> so uh, anyway, yeah. And then we, we, do, we do other fun things. We, in Mendoza, we right. did a bunch of tours of some different uh, great vineyards, some of the best wine in the world, especially the Malbec. Um, and then on this upcoming trip, we're adding a new uh, one. And this is in April of 2024. Uh, we're going to Bariloche and the Patag Patagonia country. Beautiful place. So, yeah, yeah it's, it's wonderful, beautiful. So we try to bring people to fun, beautiful places, but also connect with innovators in those places. 
And so you can really build a world-class network, whether it's in the online sessions or in the in-person meetups. And the in-person meetups aren't always just trips. Uh, you know, I, I'm going to Colorado every year now to visit my brother, and I, uh, who lives out there now. And I discovered on my first trip out there a year and a half ago, when he, after he had moved there, like, oh my gosh, I have a bunch of my previous podcast guests that actually live here now. No way. So what we did is the first time, I just reached out to six of them uh, and asked, hey, um, you know, I'd love to connect you guys all if you're available for dinner. They all responded they wanted to come. And I said, gosh, maybe I should invite some more people. Yeah. So we ended up having a dinner of about 13, 14 people. And then this second year I went out there, we just had a meetup and we doubled it to about 30 people. We moved it from a dinner to like a, a networking reception. I did a presentation on the concepts of the book here. Uh, but it was also a great way for people to meet in an actual city that they might live or travel to. Um, and so it was, that, that's what I'm trying to do is where maybe my networks are strong. Right. Florida, Atlanta, Colorado, places like that. And then also places abroad that we can go visit together and travel. Love it. Love it. And now you just mentioned uh, the concepts of your book. Can you tell us a bit about uh, what the concepts are? I know you have loads of stories here, <laughs> and and you also you identified like the traits that make successful people, entrepreneurial people, be successful. You know, uh, can you tell us a bit about that? Uh, the traits that you've identified, the concepts that you lay down in this book, and some of the stories. Maybe give us a, a, a like a quick preview. Yeah. So. What I did is, again, as I was getting close to 100 episodes of the podcast, um, and again, this was some of the thinking that evolved in the early days of COVID. I was probably 70 episodes in going, you know, I'm going to hit 100 episodes soon. Maybe I should do something to celebrate this. This is actually what led me to start Fearless Journeys because that was actually the first thought. And one, right. of, the, one of the thoughts was, well, maybe I could write a book. And because a lot of times people ask me, well, you've had all these different people on. Uh, what have you learned? What are some of the common characteristics that these entrepreneurs share. So, okay, so I put together in the introduction of this book, 10 common characteristics, things like pro these people are problem solvers, they are curious people, uh, they, they learn by doing, they are also doers, not just dreamers, but doers. Uh, these, these are people who are, li like I said, lifelong learners as well. Um, and they're also people who are motivated by love and passion. Um, and, uh, and, 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 you know, so these are some of the, some of what are the 10 common characteristics of the entrepreneur. And really that, what I do in the introduction too is as I'm talking about these, uh, different concepts, I will allude to what you're about to read in the rest of the book. So when I first set out to write this book, Lucho, I wrote it all out with a hundred stories. The first hundred episodes is what I wanted to celebrate right. these hundred people and what they had in common. And then when I was going about the process of trying to publish this, I thought, there's no way I can make enough edits to make this book short enough to let you really absorb the 100 people's stories. So there's about 45 people in this book, which is why I dubbed it Volume 1. Right. Uh, volume 2 will be out this year. Awesome. Um, I'm looking forward to it. And uh, thank you. And But what I... Uh, what I do in the rest of the book uh, is is actually go through story by story, and a little bit is also ingrained in there is my story, right? Because what I'm doing is I'm I wrote it in the first person, because I wanted you to understand uh, my journey in meeting all these people and learning and absorbing. And at the end of the book, I'm going to tell you when you interview every month one or two entrepreneurs, and you're sitting down conversations like this for about an hour, and you do this over. And over again for six, seven years, every episode that goes by, you go, man, I want to be an entrepreneur. I want to do well, something. And you are. And so, th so at the end of the book, I say, and this is what inspired me to start Fearless Journeys, to go out on my own, take the leap of faith. Um, and so, and it's not easy, uh, of course, and there's, there's a lot of challenges, but also there's a lot of actual fear. Mm -hmm. And there's even, I, I talk about this at the end of the book, is even after hiring my friend Carter Fowler to go through six weeks of branding sessions with me, mostly on Zoom. We ended the, the whole sessions with two full days in Atlanta where he's based. And that was in June of 2020 when we completed those sessions. And from June to September, I was trying to figure out what the heck, how am I going to start this? Should I raise some investment money? Uh, should I bootstrap it? Can I do this while keeping my full-time job, you know, the one with the paycheck. Um, <laughs> and so by September, I actually 
put the idea on the shelf. And I said, you know what, I'm going to stick to writing the book and keep my full-time job because I really don't see how I can do this. And by November, I had a whole different change of mind. And part of it was encouragement from some other people who knew about my idea. I, I tell you a little bit more about this story in the book. But uh, I literally just hit my hand on my desk one day and said, that's it. I'm going to start this. I'm going to figure it out. And I, within 30 minutes of actually having that thought, I actually put together a plan with 30 minutes. Like, what is my obstacle is what I had to ask myself. And my obstacle was, uh, well, I have these life expenses and I have a paycheck that is required to pay for these life expenses. So I said to myself, well, okay, what if, my, what if I changed my expenses, right? Because that, that was, it was just a total brainstorming, like not sure I was actually gonna do this. Mm -hmm. Just, okay, well, what would that look like? And how could that be made possible? And I thought to myself, well, maybe I can go somewhere and live somewhere for six months, nine months, I don't know, where my exp I can lower my expenses a lot. And that was when Guatemala popped into my head. Because a year and a half earlier, I had taken a trip to Guatemala to visit my friend Kyle, right. who was living there for six, eight, nine months to study Spanish. And when I was there for just three or four days with him, I mean, we hiked a volcano, we visited UFM, um, we, we did some fun things. So UFM, uh, a quick parenthesis here, can you tell us a bit about what UFM is? Yeah, UFM is a free market university with headquarters, the main campus is in Guatemala City. It's been around for a little over 50 years. Francisco Merikin University. Right. And um, I had known about this school for a number of years, but only in like a vague, like there's some free market university in Guatemala. That was literally my only thing I ever knew about Guatemala. And so when Kyle out of the blue tells me he left his job working for a congressman in DC, doing like PR work to go to, Gua like to, go to Guatemala just to study Spanish, I had actually at that point never been to Central America, which is right in our backyard right. here in Florida. And I said, hey, would it be cool if, like, I have a really busy travel uh, schedule in 2019. But I said, would it be cool uh, if I came down for, like, a long weekend? Would that be good enough? Oh, yeah, sure. Because the flights down there are super cheap from Florida. So I did that. Wow. And before I went, and by the way, this is the power of relationship building and thinking about things. I knew people that had connections to, to UFM. Right. Francisco Medellin. One of them actually was born in Argentina, but he grew up. Oh, really? Who's that? Uh, this is my friend Rodolfo Milani. Oh, right. Rodolfo. Oh, yeah, yeah. I've met him, yeah. yeah. I mean, I know him. Uh, Rodolfo's based yeah, in... I think we um, follow each other in uh, Facebook. Yeah, he's yeah. based in uh, Miami. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, he came here as a child when he was three years old. His parents were escaping the thing everybody in Argentina is still escaping, Peronism. Obviously, yeah. Right? And, Hopefully um, not for long. Yeah. <laughs> Milani's in power. Let's hope it, it doesn't come back. <laughs> right. So, uh, anyway, Rodolfo... I, I just sent Rodolfo an email one day. Hey... I'm going to be in Guatemala next month. I just want to visit this campus. Is it, how, how can I do that? Do I, can I just walk in? I mean, it's a private university. It's Guatemala. I have no idea what the parameters are. Do I need, uh, I would love, maybe I can get a tour. I don't know. The next thing I know, and this is why when you look at anything you do along your own personal journey, it's people, other people are, are involved in your success as well. And Rodolfo may or may not have known what he was doing. He was just being helpful that day. But he fires off an email within 24 hours of my request of just, how do I visit the campus? And the email was to the president of the university <laughs> and a couple of his high-level staff, all of which have become good friends of mine now. And um, They're all really cool people. Like, I mean, when I went to UFM, so I, I went there, uh, what was it, in 2012 or 2013? Uh, we were just starting the international uh, executive, no, the uh, Latin American executive board for Students for Liberty. Yeah. And our first retreat was in UFM, and I got to meet some, like some of the, um, like the president and like some of the higher levels in, in the UFM. Yeah. And just just being in the university itself, it was amazing because it's it's such a beautiful place, right? Oh my God! Like it's, oh, and it's a beautiful. It's, it's a beautiful campus. The campus is amazing. Like, like you're in the middle of the mountains. It's it's like a forest. But you're in the heart of Guatemala right? City. Right. It's crazy. A huge city, you know. Mm. And and yet you're, there's like this like oasis mm -hmm. in the middle of it. It's it, that's exactly what it is. Yeah. It's an oasis. It's and beautiful. what I like to say, it's an oasis of liberty as well. Absolutely. Right. Because they're keeping alive the traditions of economic freedom and individual liberty, and they're totally just very focused on education and knowledge. 
Um, it's a super interesting school. Uh, but so I go there I, at 7.30 in the morning on a Friday is when they had time for us. So we right. were there. Um, and then one of the guys who was working for the president of the university, so Gabriel was the president of the university then, uh, and uh, this guy Pablo, uh, walking Kyle and I around, giving us a tour. And he says, oh, by the way, you guys have really interesting backgrounds. If you're ever interested in teaching a class here, we have, we like, we have a, a, an environment here where we like to bring in a lot of visiting professors from other countries. And, you know, you could even teach an elective course. So I look at Kyle like, oh, you know, you might want to do that because maybe you could teach something on political science, working in D.C., all these sorts of things. For me, it literally went right over my head. It, I was literally on my first morning ever in Guatemala, <laughs> in Central America. Like, I'm never going to be teaching here. That wasn't even like something I th Had you ever would, taught? Uh, at that point, not formally, no. Interesting. So, 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 and by the way, even when I left there, there was no thought, but we made some good connections. I met up with them a few times um, at different conferences that year, one in Atlanta, and just kind of stayed connected, you know. And um, anyway, so, t so fast forward a year and a half, you know, uh, post, you're, we're in post-COVID period. We're in, uh, I'm, I'm in November 2020. Guatemala pops into my head. And I think maybe I can, I, my first thought was maybe I could just live in Guatemala while I try to build this business right. online. Lower costs. Lower costs for six months, whatever. Maybe I learned a little Spanish. I can work on my book. Um, so that was just like the first thing. Then the second thing was, oh, I wonder if I could teach a class, you know? So I literally, that day, text Pablo. I had, hadn't seen him in over a year. Probably hadn't texted him in a year. I don't know. Hey, Pablo, it's Francisco, how are you doing? How's, I literally was like, I mean, if you watch this text thread, it was probably something like, hey, how's Guatemala? How's COVID? Because that was my next thought. <laughs> I wonder what the lockdowns are like there. Well, right. by the way, up to that moment, the lockdowns were very, very crazy. There yeah, it was intense. Like six months. Yeah. But they were Even just in Florida, it was, I mean, it wasn't as bad as New York, but it was still like people were concerned. No, but in Guatemala, I didn't know this at that point. I only discovered this later. For like five or six months mm -hmm. of COVID and up to about that time of November, uh, you are not allowed to leave your house from about 6 p.m. on Friday till Monday morning. Oh, my. Yeah. And oh, even wow. on the weeknights. Like, not even for the supermarket? Uh, only you could go on the weekdays. You had certain days, like, you could go to the supermarket oh. based on your license. Like, or like did or they that. have, like, the some days were males and some were females? Something like, some like that. Some countries had stuff like that. Yeah, they had some really crazy yeah. stuff. I couldn't. Argentina I couldn't live like that, yeah. so that would be concerning to me if I was there during Guatemala, yeah. during COVID. Um, but anyway, but by the time I was asking this question, oh, the university is going to be opening up. But by the way, when I got there in March of 2021, you go around the sh outside in March of 2021, yeah. and 95% of the people were wearing masks. And I was like, for the f I, I'm, a, I'm a non mask wearer. No, outside, same here. Especially. I would always go everywhere with my mask. Like, uh, like it was, it was a pretty useless mask. It was, it was just covering my shin. Uh, yeah. And uh, I just, I just wore it because it was crazy. If I had no mask, they wouldn't let me enter the supermarket. But if my mask was was right here, they would. By the way, I kind of like, even though I don't agree with it, I kind of understand if like a private business. Is like, hey, you have to wear a mask inside. But the thing is, it, it wasn't but, it wasn't a private business decision. It was imposed by government. Right, right. Well, no. even okay, but I understand the like. I mean, I I can I can understand and cope with that when I walk inside, I have to wear a mask. Right. I didn't get the walking down the street with the mask. It made outside. no sense. I mean, so for me, the masks just yeah. never so made I, sense. So the first month I'm in Guatemala, mm -hmm. me like the free guy, like hates COVID, hates the mask, hates all this stuff is like wearing a mask outside because I was told, I asked everybody I knew in Guatemala, uh, is it the law to wear a mask outside? And they were like, yeah. I said, okay, wow. Well, I don't want to be like the foreigner putting put in some Guatemalan jail right, because right. Uh, I didn't wear a mask. <laughs> I could just see everybody back home would be like, of course Francisco was arrested for that. <laughs> uh, but then I started seeing a few people here and there without a mask and I would be like, maybe it's not really the law. Maybe, you know, and I think what it was is people there are really rule followers. Mm. And um, so I just stopped wearing a mask outside. Right. And then I started seeing, and by the way, UFM had a policy on campus that technically you were supposed to wear a mask. It wasn't them. It was actually one of the very few things that the government could ever impose on them because they're like their own, right. they're like their own like governance. It's, yep. it's kind of a different structure there. But they were 
but I started, uh, <laughs> one of my colleagues that would sit next to me in the, in the faculty center, she was, she's actually from another country. I'm not going to say who, because I don't want to get her in trouble, but uh, she, I would notice her, she was never wearing a mask in there. And I asked her, hey, what's the mask? And she goes, oh, psh, this is a bunch of BS. Uh, yeah. Said, okay. Okay. So uh, I, I created a policy in my classroom. I told the students from day one, this is like new guy just arriving there. I said, because uh, we were in these big lecture halls and I would have six or eight students in my class. What were you teaching? Entrepreneurship and innovation. And I told my students, look, um, I want to treat the classroom like you would treat a restaurant. If you would like, wear your mask in, like as you come and go. But when you arrive at your seat, it's up to you if you want to continue wearing your mask. I'm not going to teach with a mask on, um, and I'm 20 feet away from you and all this stuff. And by the way, they also had a policy. They put amazing technology in the classroom. And so this was to do the hybrid. So we could have, I could have students that were online and students that were in person. Mm. Now, my students were all supposed to be in person, but at that time, the first semester I was there, they had a policy that if a student was exposed to COVID, <laughs> they, could, they could be home. Right. And so I personally think it was just an excuse to be home when they didn't want to come in because there's also a lot of traffic sometimes. Um, but there was nothing I could do about it at that yeah. point. Um, and most of the students were in class most of the time, but every once in a while somebody would be home. And then we would have, they had this cool thing. They had a camera in the class that would follow me Oh, and nice. then we had the students that were, they were on a big screen. Right. And Oh, the, you could see the, the students. And the microphone, yeah, they had to be on camera. Nice. And the microphone uh, was really amazing. I mean, they put like hundreds of thousand dollars in investment in the, in the classroom. It's crazy. It's super high tech. Like it's in the middle yeah. of, of, it's in the middle of the jungle. <laughs> well, not quite. <laughs> oh, yes. it totally is. Like it, it's, it's the jungle, man. It's like, oh man, it's, it's a forest in there. Like everywhere you see there's trees. You mean at the, on the campus? On the campus. Well, the campus is, yeah, a very beautiful campus. By yeah. the way, I would, um, three months after living there, I, I moved into a house that was a couple of blocks from UFM. So I could, I was a four minute walk from the front door to UFM. Right. And so what I, I love to walk every morning. And so I get up in the morning, you know, at seven in the morning. A beautiful I do, walk. I would walk around campus. There. Now, by the way, I started noticing, why are there so many students here at 730 in the morning? And I started asking questions. Well, they have an MBA program. Ah. And also they have, um, uh, they start classes there. Super, the MBA program starts so classes work. At, at like 630 in the morning. Right. So they go like 630, 7 or whatever to like 8 or 9 in the morning. And then they go to work. And some of the people awesome. teaching those classes are like CEOs of companies Epic. who are teaching as like a visiting professor. So they get done at 8, 30, 9, and then they get to go to work. UFM is such a cool school. So there was like, I was like, yeah. So I would start seeing these people on campus really early. But the biggest thing I saw that really stood out to me in the early mornings at UFM was the amount of landscaping staff that would just, they just kept those grounds beautiful. And I think it's underappreciated. There's so much... Um, let's say, I don't want to call them unskilled, but low labor, low skilled labor. Um, people in Guatemala, whether they are your housekeeper, whether they are your people doing the lawns, whether they are construction people. Um, and, and I think those people are super hardworking people and they're really the, key, the people that keep everything going in a right. sense, you know? And I, I don't, I would even tell my students, you know, you, I, I hope everybody here has a gratitude for the reason that this university is so beautiful. It's these folks here that probably could never afford to go to a school like UFM, probably could barely even have a dream that their kid could go there, but they're the ones keeping the grounds beautiful. So, Amazing. Yeah. yeah. And, and it really is just so beautiful. Now, and, th and that, that brings me to, back to your book, because one thing I love about your book is it's not just entrepreneurs, it's not just business owners, right? You have people of, of all sorts of walks of life who have the entrepreneurial spirit. Uh, can you tell us a bit about those stories as well? Like uh, other people that, that are not just business owners. Yeah, so, so two that might stand out to me yeah. that, you know, like I say, most of the people in this book are not household names. You've probably never heard of them. Um, unless, of course, you're in the Fearless Journeys community because many of them are featured innovators now. Right. But uh, two people that stand out to me, one is a professional soccer player named Chris Mueller. Uh, I'm a fan of Chris because I was a, also a fan of the Orlando City soccer team when I lived in Orlando. 
And I saw Chris from the day he started. I think I was at probably at his first home game and at some of his great moments over the years. But what caught my attention was some of his tweets. And he had just a very motivational, like, spirit. Like, you know, he would be reading some of the same books I'm reading, like Atomic Habits by James Clear, things like that. And he's tweeting these things out. So I was following him on Twitter. And then COVID happened. And I noticed a few weeks or a month after COVID, he started a book club. I love books. Obviously, now I have a book club. And that's and, crazy because you wouldn't associate a soccer player with having a book club. Love it. Yeah, especially somebody who's like, at the time, 23, 24 years old, you know? And um, so I actually, when he asked for, you know, when he was, was basically uh, promoting his book club, uh, sign up here. I said, great, I'll sign up for his book club. And so when I signed up, I got an email, like one of those automatic emails that you get when you sign up for things. And I looked at the email address and I thought, I, I, wonder, I bet he's answering those emails. Like, who else is answering those emails? <laughs> right. So I just shot him back an email. Hey, Chris, I'm a big fan, blah, blah, blah. I, I have this podcast. Here are two or three episodes I think you would be interested in. And um, I would love to have you as a guest. Maybe we can talk about your book club and why you started it. A couple days later, he got back to me. Oh, I'd love to be on your podcast. He goes, I have to do it. We're, we have to be in quarantine, so I have to do it online. But yeah, so we did it. And... Um, and by the way, a year later, Chris put out his own book, which we're using at this very moment in the Fearless Journeys book club. Nice. It's called Bet on Yourself. Great book. And next month, Chris is going to join us for an online session. Love it. Unfortunately, he's no longer with Orlando City. He's with the Chicago Fire. <laughs> uh, it's his original hometown of Chicago, so that's great for him. But um, So that's a great way where we can pull somebody in. But also, the way you can see that if you go through that, if you listen to that podcast in June of 2020, you could start seeing this is a guy that is doing everything he can to control his situation and keep his mind sharp, uh, keep his uh, physical workout sharp, even though he was totally isolated from the rest of his team. So he talked about, how, when you're a soccer player, you, you're always your entire life with a team. Right. You're with coaches. As you get into college and pros, you have physios. You have all these people that are part of your team. All of a sudden, you're in a, you're in a moment of COVID. You're not allowed to be near any of them. You got to go out and dribble around cones by yourself, take runs on your on your own. Uh, he was reading books, starting a book club, all these things. So I think if you listen to that podcast in June of 2020, you got to think to yourself, this is a guy who's keeping his mind sharp. He's keeping himself. He's doing everything possible to do the best he can in a situation that none of us can control. And then he goes out, and they, they did the MLS in the bubble tournament. He goes out the first two games. He's the player of the game. Uh, the, the team goes all the way to the finals partially because he was one of the leading scorers. Kind of had his breakout season that year. Uh, on the podcast, he told me there was two goals uh, that he had uh, that Orlando City could make the playoffs. We had never made the playoffs up to that point. This was now his third season with the team. Well, by the end of the year, they made the playoffs. Awesome. And they won a game, and I was there for it. Uh, he also said one of his career goals was to play for his country, the U.S. national team. Well, in December of that year, he was called up to the national team. Epic. And he ended up getting married that year to his high school sweetheart. And um, anyway, a lot of great things. I mean, I was like, wow, 2020 was an amazing year for Chris Mueller, right? Um, so I put, I, I put not just what I did with the book, too, by the way, is I would put a lot of the stuff I, I got from the podcast. But a lot of times I, I have additional elements to the story, like the rest of Chris's journey for the next right. two years before I wrote this book is in the chapter about him. Uh, Madison Cawthorn, another person you may or may not have heard of, he was... Um, he ended up being one of the youngest people ever elected to Congress at the age of 25, in, in 2020 as well. And uh, He's brilliant. I've seen so many of his videos. Yeah. He's so, a fascinating guy. Again, I actually, my, my friend Lance Barnett, who's, who's now a member of the Fearless Journeys community, Lance and I got to know each other kind of through Florida politics, and Lance later went into real estate, which is what he does now. Uh, Lance also listened to my podcast, partially because I, when I learned he was doing real estate, uh, I said, hey, you should listen to this episode with my friend Dan Lesniak, who he later got to meet through me. Um, and Dan's like an amazing top-level real estate agent, him uh, really coach now and entrepreneur on another level. Uh, him and his wife, Carrie, have this great business. So Lance started, Lance listened to that, and then he started listening to more of my podcast. Well, Lance, I didn't know. I didn't even know who Madison Cawthorn was in, <laughs> in, in 2020. Um, most of the country didn't. But I, I, I remember I started following him on, on, on Instagram or something. And Lance calls me up one day to tell me 
him and Madison Cawthorn had been friends since they were like 14. Oh, no They way. met at some like <laughs> youth in government camp or something like that. And so then he's like, he's going, he went up to North Carolina to work on his campaign. Oh, one day he's taking a drive from Jacksonville to North Carolina, calls me up and says, hey, I was just listening to you on your podcast. Would you like to have Madison on your podcast? I said, well, you know, my pod, I, I would love to, but my podcast, I really just try to keep politics out of it. And, you know, he's running for Congress and all that. So I said, if we can find an angle, because I know he's got an incredible story. Right. So for people who don't know, when Madison, so Madison, when Lance met him when he was 14, uh, you know, he was not physically disabled. But when he was 18, he got into this horrific car accident, almost lost his life, ended up losing the use of his two legs. He still has his legs, but he, they, he can't use them. He's in a wheelchair. So um, incredible story and uh, of recovery. And he's a very smart guy. Uh, mostly homeschooled and uh, and start, did like a, a, a semester of college, but then decided college wasn't for him. Uh, he was starting to do a real estate investment firm, which is kind of following in the footsteps of his father. But uh, anyway, and that's the point where he decided to run for Congress. And so um, I said, yeah. So and I, by the way, the other thing is I love Western North Carolina. It's one of my favorite areas in the country and all the mountains out there. And that's where Madison's from. So I told Lance, you know, I was just thinking of coming up there anyway to visit you. Let's just, let's do a podcast. So I lugged all my new podcast gear up there because I had invested in some new microphones. And then Lance tells me, I said, well, where are we going to do the podcast? He goes, well, you know, Madison really loves cigars. No way. And I, I said, <laughs> he does? And he's like, yeah. So he's got this cigar lounge that he's a member of there in Hendersonville, which is a little bit outside Asheville. And he's like, maybe you guys can do it over cigars. I go, Let's do it. So uh, here I am sitting there with Madison over cigars for an hour and a half or whatever podcast. Um, so that was a that was a really fun thing. Got to know him. Ended up, you know, helping him a little bit as well. Um, and then getting to see. So, by the way, in the book, I bring you up to Madison won in 2020, but he lost in 2022. I was there with him with about 10 or 12 other people in the room when the numbers came in when he lost. So I actually write about that in the book probably nowhere else is that story told. And I, I tell you enough that you need to know. Mm -hmm. um, but I think just to get some insight. But I think the other thing I've always seen with Madison is the, uh, the mindset he has. Um, and, and you could even see this when he lost. Uh, not a happy moment. But I just, I, I document this in the book. I just saw this flick of a switch mindset. At the moment, he took about 30 seconds to sort of inhale that he had lost and that this was over and just like a flick of a switch, it's over my friends. Like, and just like moved on to the next chapter of his life. Um, who knows, maybe he'll get back in. I, I see that he's been on some podcasts recently talking about some things. I don't know if he'll run for Congress or something else again, but he's definitely, if anything else, he gained a humongous microphone. Right. And um, young guy, uh, great story. And I think, um, you know, he's at least has a strong public voice now. And that's something he created for himself. And you could say, by the way, he's not the only person I've had on the podcast that had a tragic story that landed him in a wheelchair. My, my friend John Morris did. I knew John well before he had his accident. He's actually a triple amputee. Um, he actually lost, not only lost the use of his legs, amputated them after a car accident and had one of his hands amputated. Uh, John was a huge traveler before his accident. And I, the miraculous thing is that he lived through the car accident, which the car was in a ball of fire and he wow. was, and he was not conscious when they found him. Um, and, uh, he lived, he was in a coma for a couple months, but he lived. And, and, and so the first thing was that, okay, it's mir miracle. He lived sad thing though. He's probably not gonna be able to live the kind of life he lived before with all the traveling he did. Well, I want to tell you that as a, that car accident was in 2012, and so it's been 11 and a half years, and John has actually s traveled in his wheelchair to more than 50 countries in the last 10 years. And he started a company called Wheelchair Travel, where he documents how people with disabilities can travel in specific locations. He's even done some group trips. That is so amazing. And he was just awarded uh, some magazine just made him person of the year for disabled people or something. Um, so I think it just shows you that these are two guys that are examples. The, one of the most tragic things that you think can happen to you 
that is totally unexpected, and yet you take your life and you just say, I'm going to keep moving forward anyway. And so um, I think that's what you have to do in every challenging moment you have in life is say, okay, that's the past. This is the situation. I can be upset about it. I can be depressed about it. And there's certainly going to be periods where you might be, but you got to move on and you got to figure it out. And the way that they both move on was pretty incredible. That is so inspiring. Yeah. And, 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 and it's so true. I like guess, I mean, so many people would just, uh, like if, if they had that happen to them, it's just like, okay, this is it. I give up. Like they would just let it stop them, you know, just dwell on it. And man, I lost my legs. What am I going to do now? But you, it's a choice. It's, it's absolutely a choice. Like, I mean, you can have tragedy happen to you and choose to just live with it and make the best of, out of your life, no matter what the circumstance is. Like control what you can control and just keep going. And, and, and that's super inspiring. Well, actually, I mean, I, I broke my foot. I think you remember I broke yeah. my foot in half. <laughs> Uh, I had to to walk in a like a bionic leg for like five months. Wow! Uh, and and that meant I mean I was pretty much like out of races. Well, I mean I did some races. I, I do obstacle courses as you know, and I did a couple of ninja races with a boot. And and everybody was telling me like, man, how are you doing this? And and the thing is, I just thought about those people. Like I, I see videos all all the time of, of people who are in wheelchairs who are amputees and they do amazing things and. I mean, I, I just got a glimpse of that perspective of, of having something limit you. But the fact that there were people who were much more limited than me that were doing amazing things, that inspired me to just, you know what? I'm not going to let this stop me. I kept training because of that because that's what you do. Like, you move on. This happened. Okay, keep going. Yeah. And I, I was, I'm, I'm just so inspired that there's people like that that do those amazing things no matter like if they've lost their legs, if they've lost an arm, so many tragedies happen and people do amazing things out of those tragedies. And that's so inspiring. And so yeah. when you apply that to say a business or starting a exactly. business or running a business and you think you're, you know, whatever kind of situation you're in, or maybe even just a career, you lost your job, you know, it's, uh, you, can, you can dwell on the failure, you can dwell on the, uh, the bad situation, or you can figure out okay, I'm here, maybe what did I learn from it? And that's also the other thing oh, yeah. you get from, there's not a single entrepreneur I've ever met that hasn't failed at something. And they just learn from their failures and they use it as opportunities to apply those learning, that learning to the, to the next thing they're gonna do. And it's all a matter of perspective because you can look at the failure and just, just dwell on it. Just say, man, I failed and, and that's it. Uh, or you can, you can take it, you can shift that perspective and take it as a learning experience. Because every time you fail, that's an opportunity to learn something from that and rise again. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I love it. Awesome. All right, Francisco, uh, any, any last thoughts, any last stories you want to share from your books, last, last uh, traits that you want to talk, to, talk about on, on what it is to have that ownership mindset, take ownership of your life, uh, that entrepreneurial spirit, uh, any, any closing thoughts? Well, I just think that at the end of the day, um, you just got to really build a mindset of confidence and belief. And, you know, there's probably one of the people that I featured in this book that had a really huge impact on me is actually local to South Florida here. He's in Boca Raton. And that is a guy named Claudio Sorrentino, him and his uh, buddy, uh, which is his business partner now, uh, they started a company called Body Details. It's, it's a laser hair removal, laser tattoo removal company. They now also do laser fat removal. Every time I ask Claudio how many locations they have, there's, it's always more than the last time. So it was 21 the last time I asked him. Who knows what it is now? Uh, but they started in South Florida, and now they're in Central Florida, other places. But the bigger thing in terms of the, uh, the journey he had was he said, you have to build, um, you have to be somebody who's mentally strong. So before you can start a business, you have to build the mindset that is going to enable you to go, first of all, the mindset that, that in, to, uh, of endurance, you're going to probably have to work 70, 80 hours a week uh, when you first start a business. And it might only go down to 60 or 50 at some point as you hire people, but it's probably never going to be 40. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. And uh, you, and so he said, you know, he had a good, you know, he was, he was quoting somebody else, I think. 
because it's not it's not original to him. But he said, you know, the entrepreneur is somebody who uh, would rather work 80 hours a week for themselves than work 40 hours a week for somebody else. And part of that could be that you don't want to answer to somebody else, but it could also just be that you want the freedom to be creative. You want the freedom to where you're going to work, when you're going to work, how you're going to work, all the or what you're going to work on, how you're going to be a pro. You know, he said he would be a he would be working for other people. And then as soon as he had like a solution to a problem or something new and creative to do, and well, he wasn't the, the person, the decision maker, and he was told no, he was like, well, now I have the itch to do it, right? So I want to go do something on my own. Um, so that's part of, you know, having being, I think really the biggest thing as well is being an entrepreneur gives you the freedom to do what, what you want, live how you want, work how you want, where you want, all these sorts of things. Um, but the biggest thing again, thing that he instilled in me was before you start something, you have to have the mental toughness to be able to endure the good times, the challenging times, the failures. And, and if you're somebody who needs a pat on the back, don't be an entrepreneur because no one's giving you a pat on the back. Oh, yeah. Uh, right? <laughs> so that's what, As by the way, I interviewed him in, I believe it was January or February of 2021, a month before I went to Guatemala. And I launched Fearless Journeys in June of 2021. And that was such an impactful interview for me to have just before. Um, almost a godsend in a way uh, because it really instilled in me like, that's the important thing. So when I first was starting the idea of Fearless Journeys, and I sometimes still say this, but I stopped saying this. I'd say this is a community for aspiring and ascending entrepreneurs. But that is, I've actually shifted it to say this is a community to help you build an entrepreneurial mindset. Because to me, before you start the idea, so when we think of an entrepreneur, we think of somebody who starts a business, right? Right, or maybe leads a business. But you could be entrepreneurial anywhere. Uh, you, a waiter, can be entrepreneurial. You don't think of a waiter. A waiter is not the owner of the restaurant, but the waiter is on the front lines with the customers every day. They're they're interacting with hundreds of customers all the time. And if maybe somebody walks into your restaurant and you're the waiter, and you hear this person say, "Hey, do you have this on the menu?" No, I don't. And then you hear somebody else say, hey, do you have the same thing on the menu? And you hear that three, four, five times. Then you might say, hey, there's an opportunity here. And then you might go to your manager and say, hey, you know, we've had 10 people walk in in the last month asking for this. Maybe we should start offering it. Maybe there's an opportunity. And that's just a small little tiny way that you can be entrepreneurial uh, by, by seeing opportunities where maybe none existed before. Um, but it's that process of building that mindset so that's why I try to teach this in the books and in the classes I do and in Fearless Journeys uh, is learn the characteristics, put them into practice in little small ways wherever you are, and then maybe one day, because it's very tough. I don't think most people have it in them uh, to start a business or they don't have the opportunity. Maybe they don't have the capital. Um, maybe it's not the right time in their life. Maybe they just had a newborn child or something, right? And they want to keep the safe corporate job or something, right? Which is but, a great training, by the way, having a child, because yeah. that is something hard. Exactly. And, I mean, that, that's going to be a challenge that they're going to have to face. Yeah, if it, you yeah. can have a child, you can probably mm -hmm. start a business at some point. Just oh, might not yeah. happen at the same time, <laughs> even though entrepreneurs have children all the time. Right. right? But, um, but, but there are points in life where it may or may not be suitable at that moment to start a job or leave a job to go right. start a new opportunity. Uh, but what I say is you work every day to build that mindset. Whether you end up starting that job or not, you're going to be a more valuable employee to somebody else. And so, um, so that's what I try to do with Fearless Journeys, help people to build an entrepreneurial mindset, which everybody can do. Absolutely. Absolutely. So awesome, Francisco. Well, now if anyone wants to build that entrepreneurial mindset, I highly recommend you check out Francisco's book, The American Dream is a Terrible Thing to Waste. And this is volume one. Volume two is coming out this year. Uh, also check out his podcast. What, what's the name of the podcast? Agents again? of Innovation. Agents of Innovation. Check it out. And uh, hey, I would highly advise you take one of the Fearless Journey trips because that is amazing. It's an amazing experience. So, And uh, we have one coming up in Argentina, April 2024. And you get to hang out with Lucho while we're down there. And have a lot of steak. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe a cigar. Oh, a couple of cigars, <laughs> I think. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, guys. Thank you, Francisco. Awesome. Thanks, Lucha. All right. Thank you. Boom. Peace out.